let me begin with a little uh, background. Uh, Shakespeare in The Tempest said, what's past is prologue, so I want to give you a bit of a prologue. Tonight, I think back to 1967, the year I was appointed to the tenure-track faculty at New York University. I was in Ireland that summer and uh, found myself in Mrs. O'Connor's small grocery store and pub in a small town called Sneem on the Ring of Kerry. Uh, which was rather close to where my maternal grandmother, Kathleen O'Sullivan, was born in Kilgarvin, in what uh, the Kerry people like to call the Kingdom of Kerry. And uh, as I was sitting there eating my ham sandwich and drinking a pint of Guinness, Mrs. O'Connor asked me what I did for a living back in America. And being full of myself with this new job, I told her what, you know, what I would do, I would be a teacher, I would instruct people, I would give lectures, I would do all sorts of wonderful stuff. And she said to me, uh, isn't America a wonderful grand place altogether there? They even pay you for talking. <laughs> well, I took those words to heart and I've kept them in mind ever since. It's nice to get paid for talking. NYU paid me for 50 years for just that, and uh, I'm eternally grateful. So let me see if I can say some words tonight that might be of some value to you. In his foreword to Crazy Talk, Stupid Talk, Neil Postman wrote, this is a book about talk, the kind which I think is useful and virtuous to expose as crazy or stupid. This is how we define these two kinds of talk. Stupid talk is talk that has a confused direction or an inappropriate tone or a vocabulary not well suited to its context. It is talk that does not and cannot achieve its purposes. On the other hand, crazy talk is talk that may be entirely effective, but which has unreasonable or evil or sometimes overwhelmingly trivial purposes. It is talk that cre creates an irrational context for itself or sustains an irrational conception of human interaction. Postman situated his analysis of crazy talk and stupid talk largely on the foundations of media ecology, which was the program that we had developed. And that program itself had been formed tremendously on the work of general semantics. So here I want to talk about the language of politics in 2017 in terms of Neil's interpretation of Korzybski's work. And in doing so, I am keenly aware that I cannot and therefore will not represent either of those people. But I will tell you what I understand from my interpretations of their work. I first encountered Neil Postman when I was an undergraduate student in his Introduction to Semantics course at New York University in the 1962-63 academic year. One of the first axioms he presented to the class was that words themselves have no meanings. Only people have meanings which they try to express through words. And so tonight I wish to try to do that as best I can. My approach is a media ecological model that tries to examine how people use language and other media within a culture to share information needed for mutual survival. When Neil and I, aided tremendously by Christine Nystrom and Charlie Weingartner, created the Media Ecology MA and PhD programs at NYU in 1970, our conceptual foundations included a mixture of general semantics, media theory, which I had learned from George Gordon and Charles Seekman, uh, propaganda analysis, especially Jacques Ellul's, and technology studies, again, Jacques Ellul and Lewis Mumford and a few others. As Neil liked to put it, media ecology is general semantics writ large. 
By large, he meant we were expanding our analyses of language to include all symbol systems and the media used to communicate meanings among people. But before I begin do my analysis tonight, I need to just confess to you some background to give you some context about me. As a product of a Brooklyn Irish Catholic upbringing, including eight years in parochial schools, and then four years of active service in the United States Marine Corps, I went to underwent two extreme forms of behavior modification. <laughs> Within the communication environment of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the Ten Commandments provide excellent examples of Aristotle's either-or approach to anything, with their absolutist categories of good versus evil, thou shalt and thou shalt not. The very first commandment says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have other gods before me. The second commandment takes aim at visual symbols, Neil loved this one. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Well, if you know anything about the Catholic Church at all, <laughs> you know that they ignored that commandment entirely. <laughs> I mean, where, where would be the Catholic Church without visual symbols? Um, the third commandment concerns the role of language itself. And it says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Watch your language. The power of words is present at the creation when according to Genesis, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the New Testament, gospel, according to Saint, excuse me, Saint John, the role of language in the creation is explained further. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Following my indoctrination, becoming a true believer in Roman Catholicism, I was exposed to a new set of Aristotelian either or beliefs in the Marine Corps. In addition to venerating the Marine emblem consisting of an eagle globe and anchor, we recruits were taught the official motto of the Marine Corps, the Latin Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And the Marines' hymn, note the name, hymn, uh, sometimes called from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. The fourth and final stanza, which isn't often sung at public events, but it has some incredible words, especially in the last quatrain of that, because it has to do with the hereafter. If the army and the navy ever look on heaven's scenes, they will find the streets are guarded by. United States Marines. <laughs> I hope you noted that it says, if the Army and the Navy. <laughs> there is some question about their <laughs> worthiness. Among these indoctrinations into rather closed systems of thinking and talking and acting, two ideas, one from each realm of discourse, did encourage me towards some explorations into individual critical thinking. Within the Catholic cosmology, it was the concept of individual free will. The idea that each of us was responsible for the choices we make in life and the consequences of those choices. To me, this seemed a small opening in an otherwise rather closed system. In the Marine Corps, it, it was this advice I received from my senior drill instructor, Staff Sergeant Volker on Paris Island, South Carolina in October 1955. Words I live by. Rules and regulations are made for the guidance of wise men and the obedience of fools. <laughs> I don't ever remember getting a better advice from anybody. <laughs> in analyzing the language of American political discourse in 2017, I am keenly aware of my own limitations and the limitations of the concepts and models I'm using tonight. A core principle of what we call media ecology was that any analysis of media and communication had to be grounded in the context of in which people communicate. Neil liked to say, 
Media ecology is context analysis. And therefore, in trying to understand any environment, we need to look at all of it. We not to need to look not only at the speakers and their words, but the entire environment. At a minimum, minimum, this includes trying to identify and understand the time, place, and circumstances involved, the sources of the messages, the contents of these messages, the encoding and transmission of the messages, the reception and decoding of the messages, the channels that carry the messages, the receptions and decodings of the messages, and then the responses of the audiences. In thinking about language as a medium of communication, I take my guidance from uh, such people as the German philologist and statesman and educator Wilhelm von Humboldt, whose name I just like to say. <laughs> it, Neil, Neil loved to say uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He thought, he thought that impressed audiences. Well, I like to say <laughs> Wilhelm von Humboldt. He said, and, uh, language is the third universe, midway between the phenomenal reality of the empirical world and the internalized structures of consciousness. In the Media Ecology program, we change language to media to expand our exploration. We also uh, adapted Ludwig Wittgenstein's great aph aphorism that the limits of my language are the limits of my world into the limits of my media are the limits of my world. In concerning political discourse, I recognize that today's political politics exists in a very Aristotelian binary system of right and wrong, of us against them. Today's political universe of discourse is shaped not only by politicians and their supporters' use of language and other symbol, symbolic systems, but also by the proliferation of media that carry their symbols. From morality to literacy and topography, from graphics to hypergraphics, from electric and electronic to cybernetic, these media not only carry messages, but shape our lives and our cultures within the environments they create. In 1966, Ronald Reagan, who would be elected president of the United States in 1980, said, politics is just like show business. In 1984, Neil and I both agreed with Reagan's comparisons. In amusing ourselves to death, public discourse in the age of show business, Neil devoted a chapter to reach out and elect someone, in which he quoted Reagan and wrote these words. In America, the fundamental metaphor for political discussion is the television commercial. He offered these warnings about the lessons taught by TV commercials, that short and simple messages are prefer preferable to long and complex ones, that drama is to be preferred over exposition, that being sold solutions is better than being confronted with questions about problems. In his critique of television's impact of politics in 1984, Neil provided what I think applies even more powerfully today in the, our current cybernetic media environment. Information is a, in a form that renders it simplistic, non-substantive, non-historical, and non-contextual. That is to say, information packaged as entertainment. In politics, 1984, that's entertainment. An article I published in the summer 1984 edition of Etc. I proposed a triad for analyzing the American political scene. First, the politics of issues, which evolve around a core of key issues that attract or repel voters. It, to be debating these issues, politicians and partisans use rhetoric, both positive and negative, and visual symbols, music, song, and actions to reinforce their commitment to the cause and to attack, attract new supporters. As I saw it, the campaigns of issues contain the communication of information and the pseudo-communication of propaganda disguised as information. Second, the politics of party, which demanded loyalty to the party over loyalty to any issue or candidate. Here, pragmatics ruled and parties would change sides on issues and candidates in terms of electability. One need only to consider the swapping of positions on the status of African Americans by the Democratic and Republican parties from the 1950s to the 1990s. 
during which the solid South moved from the Democrats to the Republicans. Third, the politics of images, in which the images of candidates are crafted by advertising and campaign specialists and transmitted to the public by means of all available media, especially those carrying the two entwined forces of American media, advertising and entertainment. In our present environment, media do not merely reflect reality, but create something new. What Umberto Eco called hyperreality, what Jean Baudrillard called the simulacrum, and what many call postmodern reality. I prefer the term pseudo reality, while being well aware that the name is not the thing. At this point in time, the mix of broadcast and cable television with their so called reality TV shows and 24 hour news programs that are more commentary than information, virtual reality games and platforms, Twitter, Snapshot, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media sites and applications, all wrought by what James Joyce and Ulysses called the ineluctable modalities of the visible and the audible. They all shape the context for our political communication. It is no worth noting here that Twitter, with its restricted 140 character messages, encourages simple either or answers to complex questions. Short slogans overwhelm reasoned discourse, not only on Twitter, but are the style favored on bumper stickers and television debates, interviews, and talk shows. In this brave new world of instant communication and gratification, there is scant room for non-Aristotelian political talk. When President Trump gives prepared speeches, his words tend to be more balanced and less hostile than when he tweets or speaks without notes. It seems to me this is no example of how, this is an example of how media shape the message they carry. Still, it could, I think it could be possible to use language that is neither crazy nor stupid in messages under 140 characters. <laughs> Consider this from Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. We are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Could anyone run on that this year? <laughs> to me, it is clearly a sane statement, but of course it requires, as Lincoln well knew, further exposition and explanation to communicate his meaning to the audience. Consider my 1984 triad today. During the, 1920, uh, during the 2016 campaigns, a Pew Research Center report poll from July 7, 2016, listed the percentage of voters registered voters who ranked 14 issues that were important for how they intended to vote. You will barely remember them, but I'll read them from the top. The economy, terrorism, immigration, foreign policy, health care, Supreme Court appointments, gun policy, social security, trade policy, education, treatment of minorities, abortion, the environment, and the treatment of gay, lesbian, and transgender people. <coughs> there were differences, of course, between how Democrats saw this list and how Republicans did. But according to a, uh, the poll, at exit poll by the Roper organization, after people had voted in 2016, the differences were interesting. For Clinton voters, the main issues were foreign policy, followed by the economy, then terrorism, and then immigration. For Trump voters, the main issues were immigration, followed by terrorism, then the economy, and then foreign policy. A 2017 Gallup poll tracking important issues to Americans in 2017 reports that concerns about economic problems fell from 26% in March to 17% in September. Dissatisfaction with the government and poor leadership in general reached a high of 25% in June but returned to its March percent of 18 in September. Terrorism, which ranked second in 2016, sank to a low of 1% in September. These are shifts in what people care about interest me a great deal because it gets at the mindset of the audience. And I'm not sure there is a mindset that's stable. So I see great shiftings going on there. With regard to the politics of party, in uh, 
Parties do continue to play significant, if often, and even challenge roles in America. While no third party candidate has won the White House since Abraham Lincoln and Link won the election for the Republicans in 1860, <coughs> 1860, and the Republican and Governor and Democratic Party still control both houses of Congress, and they have controlled them ever since, and almost all the state legislators. There have been some problems. In 2016, Hillary secured the Democratic Party nomination all after a very long and ugly battle with Bernie Sanders, who was not even a Democrat, but an independent. Tells you how loose the party had gotten. Donald Trump was opposed by almost every leader of the Republican Party, but managed not only to secure the nomination, but now has pretty much uh, taken over the party. Very interesting change there, where the image of a candidate may shape things to come. The, ninth, the 2016 presidential campaigns confirmed my view from 1984 that the politics of image continue to play an ever-increasing role in American life. Uh, all of the polls have been moving around on this. Uh, Hillary was thought to be the better person to control, you know, be president, but she didn't win. It has, it's hard to know what to do with it. But if you look at the slogans that we use, the words that we used in the 2016 campaign, they're quite interesting. Uh, I selected some. These, these are obviously not uh, totality of anything. Excuse me. From the Clinton campaign, Hillary for America, forward together, fighting for us, I'm with her, stronger together. They're all sort of inclusive kind of things try to get there. Trump campaign, which given that he won, we have to look at carefully, uh, make America great again. America first. Can't stop the Trump. Build the wall. Have the Mexicans pay. Lock her up. Drain the swamp, and these two are my favorites. What do you have to lose? <laughs> what the hell do you have to lose? Extraordinary. I mean, these are, are not messages about content. There's no message there. It's an emotional kind of thing, and it does speak for one thing that connects it to entertainment and advertising in America. New, new system. Anything new is better. Don't want the old stuff. We want the new stuff. Uh, how many of you uh, went for the i? What is it called? The iPad 10. Anybody get one last night? Overnight? I think they went on. They they go on sale overnight. How many tried? Anybody? Yeah. Well, and and somehow. Somehow it's a better product than the other one and it'll make your life better and communication will be improved. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you know, what the Trump campaign was sell saying was that they were going to rescue America from the great swamp of Washington and uh, what uh, Steve Bannon calls the, the deep state. One of my favorite expressions. Okay. Okay, so Donald Trump is the president of the United States, right? Not, 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 not. See, not. See, now we're gonna we're gonna have to deal with words and reality, right? Okay, uh, okay. Just the other day, uh, Thursday, yesterday, uh, the New York Times carried this headline: "Critics give way as the GOP tilts into Trump's orbit." I suppose. We have to accept that he is the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you are sane, if you understand sanity, you have to say that. Well, we have to look at what he did. As he likes to say, he won 360 electoral college votes. And Clinton only got 232. Now, it is true that his popular vote 
was only 62,984,825, to Clinton's 65,852,516, about 2.9 million more than he got. He doesn't like to be reminded of that. Uh, that's called fake news, fake statistics. Uh, I think, though, what we ought to be looking at, what I've been looking at a lot lately, is what Aristotle called the pathos of the audience, the empathy that the audience feels called the context, the speaker, and the messages. And in looking at that, which is, uh, it's been studied by people who like to call themselves a phrase that Neil Postman detested, uh, social scientists. <laughs> you, may, you may have read one of his uh, essay is called Social Science as Moral Theology, in which he uh, bashes the hell out of those people. But it's a, a much steady construct of, uh, by psychologists, social scientists, sociologists, historians, propaganda analysts, other academicians. And lately there's one called confirmation bias, <laughs> which essentially says that we tend to trust uh, information and people who support what we already think and distrust those who challenge that. Uh, as is often the case when academic theorists promote some concept that Postman thought was inane, uh, he used to always say, well, my mother or my Aunt Sadie knew that. <laughs> and um, in Crazy Talk, Stupid Talk, he gives an example of it in a, one of his famous parables. The archetypal fanatical response is given in the story about the man who believed he was dead. In an effort to free him from this idea, a psychiatrist asked him if dead men bleed. Of course not, he replied, whereupon the, upon the psychiatrist jabbed the man's finger with a pin so that they both could see the rich red blood flow. The man looked at the blood at the psychiatrist and then said, well, I'll be damned. Dead men do bleed. <laughs> In introducing this parable, Neil wrote that fanaticism begins with our falling in love, so to speak, with certain sentences. In this, Neil found nothing particularly unusual or dangerous, provided we are willing to permit the sentences to be scrutinized, subject to criticism, and revised as their deficiencies require. In this view, Neil was as was usual in his approach to critical thinking, inclined to trust in reason as the key to sane thinking, talking, and behaving. While I have tended to agree with Neil over many years about most aspects of media, culture, and communication, I have had some doubts about the appeals to reason when it concerns some people, especially those involved in conflict situations that call for partisan either or solutions. As a small addendum to Neil's recipe for sane thinking, I offer these words from the mouth of Finley Peter Dunn's his fictional Chicago Irish bar owner, Mr. Martin J. Dooley, who said on fanatics, a fanatic is the man that does what he thinks the Lord God would do if he knew the facts of the case. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> some in-depth examinations of the mindsets of Trump supporters is required before any reasonable, valid, and reliable assessments can be made. But perhaps some preliminary excursions may be order as we tr in order as we try to understand the context it within which Trump and his team use language and other symbolic systems to convey messages and meanings to their loyal followers. Well, who are they? From a Roper poll, we learned that Trump voters in 2016 tend to be more male than female, more white than Hispanic or black, and older than younger. In terms of income, 
they fell largely in the $50,000 to $100,000 a year range. Interestingly, he captured 43% of union members. Not surprisingly, 80%, 1% of Trump voters label themselves as conservatives, 41% as moderate, and 10% as liberal. An interesting comparison can be made of reported values held by uh, some Trump supporters. In a poll taken in 2016 of white Protestant Americans who were asked a number of questions, and then in 2016, October, just before the election, asked a same set of questions. To the question of whether an elected official who commits an immoral act in his or her personal life can still behave ethically and fulfill his or her duties in public and private life, in 2011, only 30% of white evangelical Protestants answered yes, as did 38% of white mainline Protestants. In 2016, 72% of white ev evangelical Protestants said yes, and 60% of white mainline Protestants said yes. Well, what had changed? Had they changed? Had the candidates changed? Something had changed. Uh, to the prompt, thinking about your vote for president, this is in 2016, how is it important for a candidate to have strong religious beliefs? The percentage in 2011 who had said very important dropped from 64% to 49%. Something had changed. And that is what's important, to understand that change. The people don't have permanent mindsets and candidates don't have permanent anything. But things are changing all of the time and that's what we need to look at. Uh, it's worthwhile thinking about uh, some of uh, Trump's language. And so I'll use the most egregious ample example to begin with uh, on the general grounds, as they say on Madison Avenue, sex sells. <laughs> the famous Access Hollywood open mic capturing of Trump talking about <coughs> women seems especially important given this uh, time of Weinstein and the rest of the uh, boys. You know, I'm automatically attracted to beautiful women. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet, just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. Trump and his supporters excuse this language as locker room talk whether it qualifies as crazy talk or stupid talk in Poston's lexicon is not clear, however, until we know what he was thinking, if he was. <laughs> the same is the case with many examples of Trump talk. Consider Trump on Abraham Lincoln, first president. Most people don't even know he was a Republican, right? Does anybody know? Lots of people don't know that. Well, according to a 2012 Pew Research poll, 55% of Amer Americans seem to know that. Actually, it's a statistic I find terribly disturbing. I mean, one has to ask only, who the hell are the other 45%? <laughs> and, and, uh, and especially those of us who have been teachers, you know, what, what, where did we go wrong, right? What had happened to us? Um, And how do we deal with terms like fake news, alternate facts? I like this Twitter. Just heard foreign minister of North Korea speak at the UN. If he echoes thoughts of little rocket man, they won't be around much longer. Uh, how does one even analyze that? <laughs> what are you gonna do about it? Um, concerning the clashes in Charlottesville, Virginia between people who self-identified as being members of the Ku Klux Klan and the alt-right, 
and there were groups who opposed them, Trump said, but we're closely following the events unfolding in Charlottesville, Virginia. We condemned in the strongest possible terms the egregious displays of hatred, bigotry, and violence on both sides. It's been going on for a long time in our country. It is worth noting that the chants shouted by the KKK and alt-right marches in their torch-lit nighttime parade, including these two examples of what I think Neil would certainly have called crazy talk. You won't replace us. Jews won't replace us. In response to criticism for equating both sides, Trump on August 23rd, 2017 said in a speech to his supporters in Arizona, but the very dishonest media, those people right there with the cameras, they don't report the facts. It's worth noting here that uh, a report poll reveals that 45-6% think, think that media make up stories about Trump and just 37% of voters think the media do not fabricate stories. More than three quarters of Republican voters, 76%, think the news media invents stories about Trump and his administration, compared with only 11% who don't think so. Among Democrats, one in five think the media make up stories, but a 65% majority think they do not. Among voters who strongly approve of Donald Trump's job performance, 85% think the media fabricates stories about the president and his administration. The same poll reported on what voters think should be done about fake news. <laughs> this is Trump who, su who suggested that NBC should lose all its broadcast licenses for having fake news. But it turns out that only 28% of, of the people polled think that the government should do such things. Uh, but these views diverge around party lines. 68% of Democrats oppose government retaliation, but Republicans support government control 46% to 33%. I don't know what to say at this point except to say, well, the First Amendment seems to be hanging in there by, not a, hell, by a hell of a lot. But it would look as though a polarity of Republicans would like to bring back John Adams' Alien and Sedition Acts, in which uh, criticism of the government was punishable. What do we, whether we call it confirmation bias or dead men bleeding, this tendency to believe our own bullshit and the bullshit of those who agree with us seems to have grown great power to persuade us that our beliefs are not only, the tr are not only true, but the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But as my old friend Charlie Weingartner liked to say, the major purpose of language is to create the illusion of certainty in an uncertain cosmos. Neil Postman, I think, had very few illusions about certainty, but he did profess a profound hope for the efficacy of reason in frequently unreasonable semantic environments. He was not alone in this. In a speech given in London on December the 15th, 1970, Abba Iban, who was at different times an Israeli diplomat, the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, and a writer, historian, said, history teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they have exhausted all other alternatives. <laughs> uh, later, in 1989 edition of his Heritage, Civilization, and the Jews, uh, Iban shortened this idea to, when all else fails, men turn to reason. My half century plus increase into the realms of media, culture, and communication, especially the environments shaped by mass persuasion and propaganda, have influenced me toward a very critical view of any expectations that people will turn to reason, even if all else has failed especially in the area of political rhetoric. Mario Cuomo, when he was governor of New York, famously said about politics, you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. I've never quite understood what he meant by these words, especially the word poetry. My own take on this would substitute bullshit for poetry. 
and reality for prose. And if bullshit is too long, strong a word, allow me to use myth instead. It seems to me that almost all political rhetoric is mythic, mythic in its binary either or structure and totalitarian in its absolutist answers to the what uh, I and some other students of uh, myth like to call the, first, the four great mythic questions of life. The, one, the first is identity. Who am I? The second is creation. Where did I come from? Third is destiny. What is my purpose in this life? And finally, the quest. How do I reach my destiny? From before recorded history, families, clans, tribes, peoples, and nations and empires have tried through culture, communication, and media to provide group answers to these questions. To me, group answers are always to be feared. I stand with Jacques Ellul, the great French scholar of propaganda, that there can be no such thing as collective critical thinking, only what some people call groupthink. To be critical, ins uh, Ellul insisted, thinking must be individual. I do not pretend to have all the answers to all the questions about the language of politics in 2017 America. The media ecological analysis I have sketched out tonight is not the only way one might examine the science and sanity of contemporary American political discourse. I am keenly aware of my own and my model's limitations. As Neil wrote in Crazy Talk, Stupid Talk, this idea that human intelligence is engaged in its most functional activity when in the process of refutation has been given sophisticated expression by the philosopher Karl Popper. He calls his point of view fallibilism. It proceeds from the simple assumption that all people are fallible and that it is not possible for anyone to know if he or she is in possession of the truth. Therefore, to devote oneself to justifying one's belief is essentially an act of fanaticism and the source of much cruelty and injustice. Karl Popper proposed that when we aspire toward critical rationalism, that's what we should do. This is what Neil and Charlie called in uh, teaching as a subversive activity, crap detecting. <laughs> uh, Neil also commented, it, it showed that uh, he and Charlie and Karl Popper were raised in different neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> but as Sir Karl Popper himself put it, his ideas in the open society and its enemies, we can say that our that in our search for truth, we have replaced scientific certainty by scientific progress. I understand proper, proper to mean that fallible human beings can never know the whole truth, but we can discover what is not true by using the scientific method, which proper, proper excuse me, describes thusly. In so far as scientific statements refer to the world of experience, they must be refutable. And in so far as they are irrefutable, they do not refer to the world of experience. In closing, allow me to return to the interfacing of politics and poetry by quoting one politician and one poet. The politician was the 35th president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and he said, if politicians knew more about poetry and more poets knew about politics, I am convinced the world would be a better place. <laughs> the poet was William Butler Yeats, perhaps Ireland's greatest modern poet and winner of the 1923 Nobel Prize for Literature, who wrote these words in 1918. We make out of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but out of the quarrel with ourselves, poetry. <laughs> to me, science and sanity might be found in Papa's critical rationalism and Yeats's conce concept of poetry but you will not find it in fanaticism and political rhetoric. As Neil put it in the last paragraph of Crazy Talk, Stupid Talk, and so it comes to this. 
The arrangement of our minding is a, excuse me, a Sisyphean task. We can never finish doing it. We can only keep pushing the rock, armed with what William James called the feeblest force in nature, our capacity to reason. Good luck and good thinking. Thank <laughs> you.